Uh, I am in Novato, California, which is about uh, 40 minutes north of San Francisco. So there's, uh, Cre- yeah, Crescent Bay and then up north and then Half Moon Bay down in the south. And it's just, it's amazing. Like every time we drive around, we're just kind of always stunned by the, how beautiful the area is that yeah, we live man. in. I would, totally, I would live there in a heartbeat. Yeah. In a heartbeat. I mean, besides the earthquakes, right? I mean, that's one of the things that you yeah. get up in that area, unfortunately. <laughs> Landslides scare me. <laughs> yeah. Well, we've got right now, yeah. the wildfires are really what are killing us. I mean, the, you smell it. We do. Like last year, there was really bad ones up in Sonoma and Napa, and it was it was crazy. I mean, we had, you know, we packed a go bag. We were ready to hit head out if we had to. And the fire got a couple miles from our house. It was it was pretty scary. And there's now five or six in California. Uh, one which is you know only 20 miles from where the last one was so it's uh that that you know the earthquakes are you can't prepare for i mean you can no, you prep can't. obviously yeah. but like they come they hit they happen they're over and like then you deal with the aftermath but the fires just go on for days and days and days and you know uh, and you never know right when I mean, they can jump yeah. oh yeah spark. No. That's what started them right a spark yeah and yeah, miles yeah. Where it can fly potentially and stay yeah. wet. I mean, I mean it's dangerous. Jumps, yeah, it's highways and I mean it's crazy because just right, you know, again a couple miles up the road from our house, you'll drive down the road and it'll be like all this stuff's burned, and then this one little structure happened to survive. Like, how did that happen? You know, I gotta tell you though, man, yeah. I live in a much more dangerous situation. Like yesterday, I stood on the platform waiting for the subway for thirty seconds extra. <laughs> And I was aggravated, right? I had to talk to this guy next to me. He wouldn't leave me alone. He was, you know, Wall Street guy dressed in a thousand dollar suit, whatever. Right. Crazy, man. It's crazy. Are, are it. you in are you in New York? Yeah, I'm in New York. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Yeah, I, I I like New York, but honestly, man, I miss that stuff out there. Right. I like Los Angeles and California and straight up through that entire coastline. Yeah. I would live there in RP, unfortunately, you know, genetics yeah. I think stuck me in New York and it doesn't want me to leave. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Have you always been a, a Cali guy or? Yeah, I grew up in Southern California um, in a little town called Seal Beach, which was nice because it was, you know, again, kind of a little beach town. Um, but uh, we were, you know, 30 minutes from downtown L.A., 20 minutes from Disneyland, like next to Irvine. Oh, wow. So uh, it was a pretty great place to grow up. And Story. Then, I mean, that's such yeah. an amazing way to grow up. I mean, all the stuff that kind of the Americana Disneyland. Yeah. You got to watch grow, right. You've got to watch it kind of grow up, huh? Yeah. And um, yeah. And, you know, again, growing up in a little beach town is very different than I think, you know, being in L.A. proper or other places. So uh, and then I moved to went to UC Santa Cruz for, for college. Um, and then after that, moved to San Francisco lived in San Francisco for a long time. And then, you know, when it was time to buy a house and get a dog and all that moved, moved up to Nevada, which was kind of, you know, has a small town feel too, you know, so, which is nice to kind of return to that. That's cool. Uh, yeah. So what'd you study in college? Uh, I, you know, it was funny cause I went in knowing I wanted to be a creative writing major, but my backup plan was uh, marine biology. And um, cause wow. I was always, yeah. You know, again, growing up in kind of a beach town and being, yeah. I snorkeled and dove a lot uh, growing up, um, and uh, it's a good thing I got into creative writing because chemistry is hard. <laughs> like, <and that's, laughs> yeah, they wouldn't even be taken in high school. They said, "No, dude, just yeah. go take some art classes or something. Don't yeah, worry about so, don't worry about chemistry. Somebody else will take care of it for you in your life." And I should I should have known going in, you know, because when I was in high school, I was you know I was in like honors English and history and stuff like that, and uh, I actually did okay in biology, but. I was in like football math, you know, I was on the football team and uh, I was in what we would joke jokingly refer to as kind of football math where that wasn't my strong suit. So uh, yeah, it wasn't mine either. I was in yeah. the same, you know, I had the wrestling coach as my math teacher. Yeah. Right. You know? <laughs> uh, I don't want to say anything negative about, about coach Woods because, you know, he was kind of a badass, but right. at the same time he was the wrestling coach and, you know, he had the big gigantic cauliflower ear or whatever going on. Right. Which, right. How much math could you learn from that guy? We ate donuts most days. I mean, uh, <laughs> so yeah, so it was, uh, yeah, so it was good. You know, again, I still love marine biology and, uh, love, you know, swimming and, and, uh, did you, you get know, a chance to play uh, football for college or for, no, you know, it was, this was what was really funny. So g- growing up, um, for me, uh, nobody had really gone to college in my family and I, you know, um, and so I, you know, I kind of had my, my eyes set on that, but I didn't really understand how it all works. So 
I, I loved playing football, but my main motivation for playing football in, in high school was to try and get in, you know, some kind of scholarship to go to college. Yeah, that was mine and, too. That yeah. was always my dream, right? Just to go to college, using that as the way to do it. Totally. So, um, and what's funny is that probably like my junior year, I had a teacher, my, my English teacher actually pulled me aside and we were talking about, you know, my career aspirations and what I wanted to do with my life and all that stuff. And I had, you know, I was hyper focused on, on football and I was, I was just kind of like mediocre at best, you know, and uh, football yeah. I wasn't, I, I loved it. I, it myself, wasn't. Man. I thought it was great, but looking back on it, I broke my arm. I blew my knees out. All of them, all ankles got yeah. sprained every single season. Totally. Yeah. So I had buddies that, you know, they waltzed through seasons. No scratches, you know, right. they, didn't even, they weren't even sweating during practice. I'm like huffing and puffing and dying. <laughs> well, I, was, I was pretty lucky because I, I got, you know, I tweaked my ankle once in the off season, like tripped on a weight in the weight room and I broke a couple fingers playing, but it wasn't, there was nothing major that I kind of, you have, for, a, but, you know. do you have bent finger syndrome right now? I, I, I do, but <laughs> that's the other funny thing. I, one of my fingers, I can't extend all the way, but I actually did that playing flag football well after <laughs> I graduated that's, that's high funny. school. <laughs> but yeah, so this teacher pulled me aside and she's like, look, you, you know, I told her that, you know, I, I was putting so much energy into football because I, you know, I saw that as my ticket to go to college. And she's like, well, the, you know, your grades are pretty good. Like there, there's probably other ways for you to get into college. And so she kind of opened my eyes to that. And, and uh, I played all the way through my senior year, but I ended up going to UC Santa Cruz where there is no football team. I think the only team we had that was of note was like our ultimate Frisbee team, you know, and <laughs> they went to like nationals or whatever. So That's I ended California. up, you know, spending four years obsessed with getting into college on a football scholarship and then ended up going to a school with no football. <laughs> so you got a, you did, did uh, uh, get a degree in creative writing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. So, was it uh, specialized? I mean, because you have had a kind of interesting writing career. And obviously, you know, you were an English English teacher, loved you, wanted you to go to Eng writings. I mean, you were yeah. writing before. Yeah, you yeah. You went so, to college, right? Yeah, this was actually the thing that kind of um, – so I always knew I wanted to be a writer. I mean, it's like my earliest memory is what do I want to be when I grow up. Um, yeah. And I was reading uh, – I started reading Stephen King really young, and I think – and Dean Koontz and some other guys. Um, That's amazing. That's similar yeah. to a lot of dudes. I mean, I would imagine yeah. we're right around the same age. Yeah. You graduated right. in 95, probably the same or? Yeah. So I, I graduated in 91 and then. 91. Uh, yeah. So so a couple years older, but um, it was like Dean Koontz and, and King and Robert McCammon um, read a lot of that. And then um, read, um, it's still my favorite book, To Kill a Mockingbird when I was in like sixth grade. Uh, which made, I was like, that was amazing. You, were you made to read it or did you read that on your own? No, I actually read it on my own. We had, you know, we did, and this is also funny. You look back and you're like, man, I, I was all over the map because we, we used to do book reports, you know, every month or whatever in this class I was in. And uh, one month I did To Kill a Mockingbird. And then the next month I did one of the books in the V series that, you know, V, the, the, the television series. Based on the television series. <laughs> yeah, there's uh, all the these books. And, of episode 12. <laughs> yeah, this was like, it was about like in the Everglades, they set up some like facility where they were, you know, creating like mutants <laughs> combined. You know, so, so, so my teacher's like, what is wrong with you? Like, <laughs> You're going to make like, video like, games someday. Right. You're gonna and then I read conflict. like Battlefield Earth and like yeah. all those. Oh, things, wow. So. Um, which and is, saw you know, today uh, a whole booth of Scientologists. Yeah, at right. Wakan just like a month ago, they told they asked me if I wanted to look at that. I said no. I saw the movie. Uh, yeah, it was all good. The they book was actually it. really interesting. Yeah, so they said it was really good, like worth reading. Yeah, I mean, just as a I had no idea about Scientology, but as a sci-fi book, you know, it was super interesting. So, but yeah, so I I used to always read and write, and then um, around I think I was in fifth grade. God, so what was I? I was like ten or eleven, and I, one of my teachers sent me to this um like writing workshop where i got to meet a bunch of writers uh cool. that, you know professional published writers like at the queen mary it was this really weird thing but it was so weird the only memory i have of it was this one writer pulled me aside he was an older guy i couldn't tell you who he was or what he wrote but he told me like oh if you want to be a writer you have to immerse yourself in film which i i was watching a lot of film too but he's like the movie you need to watch is this movie called videodrome and like, I'm like 10 or 11, uh -huh. right? And so for my birthday, my dad goes and we didn't have cable or own a VCR or anything, right? So he goes and he rents like a laser disc player for the, my birthday for me. I have a sleepover. And I was like, well, this guy told me I had to watch this movie, Video Drone. My dad doesn't look at what it is, right? And we get it. And I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's like, 
you know, I've heard a, of it, but a, I don't know what it is oh exactly. God. It's this creepy. It's a. It's like a hard R-rated movie that Cronenberg directed, and it's like, oh my God, okay, yeah. now I get it. <laughs> it's like James Woods plays this guy that basically gets movies for late night or gets TV shows and movies for late night cable. So it's like all this pornographic stuff, and then he he stumbles across these like snuff films, and like it plants this weird tumor in his brain, and like, oh and yeah, and he goes insane. So like. I, like all my friends left the room like halfway through and I'm like I watched the whole thing and then afterwards I was like oh that was you know it's kind of mind-bending and mind-blowing but I'm like you know the irresponsibility of this writer to tell me I should go watch that but that again kind of or the responsibility because yeah. look what ended up happening ultimately I mean sure, what's right? your opinion obviously well, it was crazy but did yeah. it I mean stop you you didn't go okay I'm done guys I'm done with film Huh. No, it There's really got me. it really got me and and I'm then gonna I go I, into I, vanilla salesmanship that's what I'm gonna devote my life yeah. to <laughs> no. And after that, I became I became a huge like I look back at the generation before me with like Spielberg and Lucas and all those guys. And I think like Famous Monsters of Filmland was like their go to magazine. Well, for yeah. me and all my you know kind of peers, it was Fangoria. And like I got my eyes open to that magazine based on, again, things like Videodrome and, you know, uh, Terminator and uh, Alien and all these uh, like kind of almost sci fi horror. And then and then that just like. I just, I became a nut and obsessed with all that stuff. And then meanwhile, I was reading, you know, Stephen King and McCammon and, and Kuntz and those guys um, as well. And then that, you know, and again, I can remember, I, I can remember vividly just, you know, pretending that I was, I, I wrote a letter to Stephen King once asking him if he would uh, uh, write Creepshow 3 with me, you know, so it was like. Did you I get never a response? No. You didn't get a response. Okay. <laughs> never. But I, I don't think he does many collaborations. So I, no. Yeah. Sure. But I, I was so excited about it, and I loved Creepshow one and two. And then I did meet Dean Koontz once, and this was actually the nicest thing ever, anybody ever did. My so my mom took me to meet. He was signing books somewhere down, you know, south, and and uh, she took down to Southern California, and she took me to meet him. And I actually had a copy of a story that I had written. This was in high school, and I was. Um, it was the first short story I'd ever written. I'd ever finished. And I gave it to him with like a return envelope. And he actually, it was like four or five pages. He read it and he wrote a bunch of notes and he was very critical. It was a very, it was like, like he was not nice. It was all hardcore critical feedback of like, this is repetitive and this is way too obvious. I had some, I still can vividly remember. I had some, like I alluded to some guy in a lab coat and it, his lab coat spread out like a vampire's cape. And he's like, this is way too on the nose. I know who the bad guy is right now, you know? Um, oh, interesting. Yeah, and it was awesome because it really it hurt my feelings, but at the same time, I look back on it and I was like, oh man, it totally toughened me up, and it was all really good feedback. It none of it was off base, right? It wasn't like yeah. I mean, he, it, I've it, seen it, quotes by him. Yeah. He's hardcore like that. Mm -hmm. When he when he considers writing, it's not really yeah. about the horror elements of the no. story. That's most, I mean, it's about the craft. Then not even the yeah. craft, it's the mechanics of the language on paper. Well, you yeah. Know, and, and for him to take the time to like read and, and provide written feedback in yeah. the margins to like a 14 or 15 year old kid was amazing. That's so you know? cool. Uh, Do you have that yeah. still? I don't, I can't, I've been looking, you know what? I'll bet you anything. I was so pissed off when I got it that I like tore it up, you know, um, or threw oh. it away or whatever, you know, again, a emotional 14, 15 year old kid who had never been told like by any, you know, all my teachers have been like, Oh, yeah. you're fantastic. Right. So you get this built up in your head that like, you know, you, like you don't need any criticism. That's the other thing. Like for me, and I tell people this all the time when they're like, oh, how, you know, how do I, what should I do if I want to be a writer? And my biggest advice is like, read a lot of books on writing. Like, don't, I didn't do that until after college because I had this whole like, well, I'm a writer. It's a talent, right? And it's, <sighs> and it, but at the same time, it's like, I, I read On Writing by Stephen King after I graduated college. And I was like, oh my God, this is, I wish I had read this you know, back in high school, this is transformative, you know? Yeah, it, it is transformative. And I did read that a long time ago. And yeah. when I read it, I didn't do what was necessary. <laughs> I, don't I don't know, know if I, I still do. My magic or something. Yeah, right. Well, it's, I mean, there's a lot of really good practical advice in there. And then he is so, yeah. the other thing I, I, and I tell people about this all the time, like that end of that book, because he was, he, he finished that book after he got in that accident. He is so angry and emotional in that, but it's like, he keeps telling you throughout the whole book, write the truth. Well, isn't the, isn't the like, story there's he, so much truth there, you know, he wrote half of it before the accident, yeah. right? He was yeah. loving it. It was loving the experience of going through his life. And then he had the accident. Yeah. And then like cathartically or something picked up rewriting the, 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 right. the how to and it, like made him better. Yeah. And when he tells the story and it's so insane of like yeah. him being in like the laundry room and his wife had set up like a little, you know, desk for him, writing desk for him to work there. 
And he's like, he was in so much pain. He can only write for, you know, short stretches and he's like sweating and all this stuff. But it was, it was super cathartic, but it's like, it's just a, you know, he, he preaches in the whole book. You have to write the truth and you have, you know, you have to tell the truth. And then you read this section like, oh my God, he's like, he's telling his truth and he's not pulling any punches. He hates that guy, you know? Yeah. So it was he ended um, up dying yeah. too, didn't he? The guy in the van. Yeah. The guy a couple of years ago, I think the guy that hit him, but or some, I, think it was a I don't know. Yeah. I can't remember, but I just, you know. It wasn't uh, just Stephen King. A lot of people hated him. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, because the world kind of woke up to Stephen King kind of being a godlike literary figure. Right. Because you almost lost him, right? And you're like, mm-hmm. oh my God. He died. Yeah. I mean, ultimately, he so, died. He came right. back. You have to yeah. see the versions of his work. Yeah. That's so, pretty incredible. Yeah. So, I mean, going back to the original question, it was kind of like I knew that path going in that I wanted to be a writer. And then, but I, it was funny because when I got there, there was no, there was no genre fiction in yeah. any of the kind of like um, the professors, and I would submit stuff, and they'd be like, "I have no idea what to do with this," you know, like yeah, whatever, exactly. You know? um, so I ended up hanging out actually with one of the poetry professors, and spent a lot of time with him, and he actually is the guy that kind of got me into the program. So I ended up doing my senior thesis was a novel, but I also did a collection of poetry. I wrote a screenplay. I ended up rather than focusing on one area because there was no kind of, there was nobody there to kind of give me feedback on any kind of genre fiction. Mm-hmm. I ended up kind of bouncing around to different professors and trying a bunch of different things, which I think was really helpful because I've written in almost every medium since then. And then, uh, uh, and then that poetry professor actually ended up, you know, kind of putting me in touch with a guy that he knew who had written some comics and, and that kind of got me in uh, the door, which was nice too. So you graduated college in like what, 95, 96? 95 yeah and like three years later you published a book right i mean there's yeah, obviously yeah. a lot of heartache in there but three years later you're published yeah um, that's the uh the monster manual right the field guide to north american monsters yeah it's a great um, title i love that i almost yeah. i wanted to buy it i want the amazon yeah. to buy it right now <laughs> and what you can't buy it it's gone it's out of print. yeah it's out of i mean it's 20 years old right so it's out of print uh you know i can send you a copy if you want but, uh, <laughs> yeah, so shoot, shoot me an address and i'll send you a copy but it uh yeah so that actually i graduated college i knew i wanted to be a writer um i found a job uh with working with a literary agency um where i was doing some ghost writing and looking at some missions and and edit some light editing and things like that but i pitched that book to my um my boss who basically agreed to be my agent on it and uh, we went we sold that and then sold rights to a sequel as well which is the field guide north american hauntings um and it was funny because again talk about like looking back at your career i wish that my original pitch was that it was more like the um those kind of old fairies and gnomes books and it would be all ill hand illustrated and but that there would be a lot of fiction that there was a fictional element that actually original pitch had this you know, kind of fictional background about this family traveling across country. I've got a lot of brothers, so it was kind of focused on these brothers that were traveling across country, encountering all these monsters, um, which reminded me of my trips when I was a kid. You know, we, growing up, we didn't have a lot of money, so we did a lot of car trips, and we went to, mm-hmm. you know, all throughout the, the Midwest, and the, you know, uh, I wasn't on a plane until, you know, I was, like, in high school, so. Um, Where so do you fall at in your brother that. situation? I'm the middle of five. You're the middle one. Yeah. I mean, um, are they all kind of into the science fiction, fantasy kind of role playing game thing? No, not at all. So, like, my uh-huh. oldest brother is an accountant. Um, like, ever? He never loved like the same kind of stuff. So they like my two older brothers like horror movies, and they kind of introduced me to that. They actually tied me to a chair and made me watch Alien when I was really <laughs> young. Yeah, so that, that was awesome. And you know, it's really uh, sad that doesn't that dates itself very badly. The alien, anyway, when they actually yeah. focus on the on the camera, I watched it. Yeah. You know, there are really good parts to that, and yeah. then they're they show the alien. It's really awful. It's it's, it's, so it's such a good haunted house movie, though. And like, it, yeah. I mean, Aliens is I like Aliens better because it's you know it's, it kind of turns into a balls out action flick by the end. But yeah. Um, but yeah, so they kind of introduced me to that. But they were both they both played a lot of baseball. They were both uh, quite a bit older. Um, they you know. Um, there's like eight years between me and my other, my next oldest brother. And so, and they fished a lot or so, which I, again, love doing that. So we had some overlapping interests, but um, they definitely were not, you know, kind of, I was kind of the odd, oddball there. And then, uh, and then I have two younger brothers and one of my um, younger brothers is, you know, much more into all the same stuff that I am. Oh yeah. Yeah. And in fact, we just spent like, he and I drove my mom to the airport this weekend and, 
on our way back, you know, an hour long drive, we spent the entire time talking about solo, and like di dissecting solo and getting into the, the weeds. Are you upset? That. Are you happy? No, I was really happy. You know, I, so to be honest, like I got to a point in my life where like, and it's not just Star Wars, it's with everything. I try and go, I'm very stoic about this stuff. I try and go in <laughs> with really low expectations for everything so that I'm always pleasantly surprised. So like, like Jurassic World, I went in with super low expectations and like, it tapped into like the, the 12 or 13 year old me. And I, I walked out of Jurassic World going, yeah, there are plot holes a mile wide and she's running around in high heels and that's annoying. And there's all this other stuff. But like the 13 year old kid in me was like, yeah, but fucking T-Rex and the Velociraptor teamed up to kill this thing. It was all, you know, it was awesome. Right. So I haven't seen Jurassic yeah. World. And you know what? The whole thing, Michael Crichton was, was yeah. a discovery after Jurassic um, Park, the first one. Yeah, so, I mean, me. after that, I read all the books that he wrote, yeah. and I was like, I can't get into the movies anymore. They're just so bad. You, yeah. you know what I mean? But I feel you about being stoic, and I love yeah. Solo, except for that monster, oh, just, that, that worm, whatever. But yeah. you know what? They just could stop doing that. Every single movie, they throw in this dumb animated monster thing, and it's yeah. bad. And it makes the movie right. horrible. But yeah, I also but realized I, the other day, I'm the dude that went to Phantom Menace like six times trying to love it, and I still <laughs> want to love it. I watch it. I, I put it in occasionally, and I'll press play, and I'll watch it all the way up until Jar Jar comes on, and I can't do yeah. it anymore. Yeah, I have a hard, I mean, again, it's hard because I was at LucasArts when, we, when all those movies came out. So I have, you know, a totally different kind of perspective on it. And it's hard to separate the work that I was doing at the time from those movies. So I kind of just, you know, kind of, I mean, my kids will watch them every once in a while. But those, I kind of just ignore that and focus on the, the you know, either you know, the original trilogy, which I loved, or the new stuff. And it's amazing because I, I feel like, you know, I, I love Solo. There was so much about it that I liked. I forgot that it wasn't Harrison Ford, which I was really worried I was going to be like, I love no that way dude. Actually, gonna be, yeah, he was very I mean, charismatic. He worked for me. I didn't care. Yeah, I, I, and he and and it was funny too because like I was a little underwhelmed by the trailer, so I think that's probably why I went in with really low expectations. But I loved the meeting with Chewie. I thought that uh, you know um, Glover did a fantastic job as oh, hell yeah. Lando. I thought Woody. I I'm a huge Woody Harrelson fan. Like I'll watch almost anything that guy's yeah. in. So like. I thought he was great. I thought I mean, the whole movie was good, and 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 I love the you know I don't want to spoil anything, so but I love the. I mean, honestly, the, you know you're movie. Reddit famous, right? I'm Reddit famous. Yeah. Oh, I didn't. I had no idea. No. You know that when people <laughs> talk about badass Han Solo stories, uh, story comes up time and time again. Which which one? The the Indiana uh, the Jones one? Baka Bigfoot story. <laughs> yeah, I love that. So that it's so funny because the people either love that story or they hate it i have i have art from it i home, you know? <laughs> freaking love it dude and everybody that i see on reddit who mentions it and it's one yeah. of those things like i love andy weir it's another yeah. one of those reddit famous things and the yeah. egg crops up all the time right? right right and your story crops up all the time too i mean you've you've got a part of that now when people start talking about han solo and chewbacca and maybe even bigfoot for that matter yeah i mean there are so many little things that you can crop into well, it took, Star Wars. It, it took all my great loves and like, and this is my other, I guess, guilty confession. I don't, and I think it's because of when I saw the movies, but I think out of all the indie movies, uh, Temple of Doom is actually my favorite, which people look at me like you're, you're insane. Right. But like, I would never look at you, you like know. that because I don't yeah. understand why people have Ajita against the Temple of Doom. I really yeah. don't understand it. It's so good. I love I it. Know. I, well, and so the I was able to get a, I mean, the there. dude got his hand inside somebody's chest That's and he pulls right. out a heart. Yeah, uh, I'm thir I'm I'm young, eight, nine, seven years old. Yeah, man, Indiana Jones was my hero then. Yeah, Han Solo was my hero. I didn't realize how much I loved Han Solo until I saw Solo. Yeah, no, me really too. Well, and this was the other thing I was worried about. I was worried that I wasn't gonna be able to connect with the character because, he, you know, again, because of what happens to him in, in Force Awakens, you know, and mm -hmm. so I was just kind of like, am I gonna be still invested and interested? And they did such a good job. I thought, you know, kind of making you care about him and the, and the supporting cast. And, and uh, yeah, so I, you know, I disappointed that fan. Uh, well, I don't care. Spoilers doesn't matter. Ultimately <laughs> at yeah. this stage in the game, Maybe. I was really mad that Fanny, Fanny Newton died so early. I love her. Yeah. And I wanted her to last. She, you can't have an actress like that in a movie and say you're dead in the first part. Yeah. I mean, I mean if I, if I have to knock the film, it, it's things like that. They introduce this really awesome supporting cast and then, they kind of all get wiped out and they're not, you know, very few of them are going to kind of continue forward. Um, Unfortunately, you have but, to yeah. blame Kathleen Kennedy stepping in and kind of ruining the vision of the original directors because I yeah, think so a lot I, of those actresses it. couldn't come back to do the reshoots. Oh, I wonder. If, yeah. I don't, I don't know anything about the timing. I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, everything I've heard about her is 
you know, been super, you know, the, the people I know that still work there at LucasArts or LucasFilm, um, everything's yes, super positive, under, you know. All positive. So, oh, yeah, everything I've heard is super positive. So, like, I, you know, I almost... Like, they love her. They love working for her, and the yeah. product is what they're expecting. I mean, I was just, I wish, I hate that you have something interesting, like, hey, we're going to put these two directors in charge of Solo, and they're going to tell this story, but most of it's going to get cut, and then this other guy's going to come in and kind of wrap it up. Yeah, I, like I don't they, know. Thing in the other one, right? What was it um, for uh, when they steal the Death Star plans? Rogue oh, one. Rogue One, yeah, yeah. The same thing there, too. They second guess themselves. And you have to wonder, the movie was good. There were holes. Was it much worse before the reshoots, or was it different? Because different's okay, I think. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, you know, again, for me, I look at it and I think it's such an interesting, and my brother and I were actually talking about this. It's got to be such an interesting challenge for, you know, Lucasfilm and for Disney, because on the one hand, you want to kind of recapture, not recapture, but maintain the kind of the feel and the vibe of Star Wars overall, right? And I feel like they've done a really good job with that with all the movies. But then at the other, on the other hand, you also want to introduce new, new voices and new characters and new storylines and new tones even, right? Like, and and I think you know, I think they're starting to do that, and I that's what I really liked about Solo. It felt like, and even Rogue One. Rogue One, I felt like had yeah. a very different tone from the the other from um, Episode Seven and Eight, um, and you know, and Solo does too. Um, so, and I don't know if it'll ever be as wide as like Marvel. You know, like where Ragnarok has a, a very very different tone from. What's your opinion you know, on that? Would you want it to be that big? I don't, you know, I don't know. It's hard because, again, you're talking about Star Wars is so... This um, connected story has been specific. so connected to Star Wars, uh, Star, yeah. uh, Star Wars, uh, Skywalker. You know what I mean? That right. uh, that little, you know, family unit, every yeah. story has some connection back to that ultimate storyline. Can you get away from it? I'm really curious. And I want more. I really yeah, do. I, th- I, I, feel well, the I think in terms of getting away... Yeah, I think in terms of getting away from the Skywalker stuff, I think you absolutely can. I mean, we've seen stories that have been successful in, in other media... I mean, you've involved yeah. yourself in stuff like yeah. that. I'm not sure the Force Awakens I played, not the Force Awakens. Um, Force, Force Unleashed. Unleashed. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I played the first one and the second one, but I don't remember yeah. that much. Yeah. But what I do remember is Galaxies. You were only producer on that, though. What does uh, that so, mean exactly? Yeah, so the way that it worked at LucasArts was um, we had external projects that we were developing with external groups. Um, and in this case, it was SOE, uh, Sony Online Entertainment, that was building Star Wars Galaxies for us. Yeah. So my role was, it is actually, in, in that particular role, was kind of half business and production side and half creative. Um, and the reason I really wanted to kind of step into that role is that I, I, when I first started working at LucasArts, one of the things that was interesting for me was looking at kind of, you know, George Lucas and his career and 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 what he was kind of good at and i felt like he 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 was really good at at kind of straddling that line between being in the center of creative production and business so like you know obviously creatively it's it's very hard to argue with the original trilogy and everything he did to make star wars and then indiana jones and yeah right i mean yeah the guy hit a lot of home runs yeah he's a genius in in many respects in that that area right and then on the business side as i learned more and more about what he had done to kind of build lucasfilm and the risks that he took and and how hard he fought to hold on to rights and and things like that i was really really impressed and then when you hear about his production sensibilities um and the fact that he knew enough to know the way i always looked at it is that he knew enough during the making of, of especially the original trilogy to kind of where he was pushing people right to that edge of insanity and where, you know, cause that's yeah. kind of where you want to be, right. You want to push people to, to just there. Like we know that this is just barely possible. Um, so you kind of, you know, you shoot for the Mars and, and oh, yeah. the moon, oh, yeah. you know? right. Or the, the, yeah. the, 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 the slide that was it called the edge of the paper or whatever. I mean, he's always, yeah, right. he's the reason that the film industry is the way it is today. Exactly. I, right. And there's, yeah. Yeah. And so much, yeah, and so much, and, and and it goes beyond Star Wars, right? I mean, the fact yeah. like you go all the way back to like young Sherlock Holmes and Island doing the first kind of digitized character, he, and then Jurassic he flavored Park my childhood in a big way. And yeah. my point in mentioning Galaxy is not only because you worked on it, because I really wanted to go there when I saw that in your wiki. I was like, oh, dude, we're talking about. Yeah, I played the shit out of that. Yeah, right. Oh my god, I loved this so much. I, you know what it was, and I'm gonna branch off just one brief second. The Jedi storyline when you first started the game, when it first came out, and you were building up the the powers to become a Jedi and searching that quest, that giant thing. That was badass. 
And yeah, when I came, I stopped playing for a while, came back, yeah. and then I could just be a Jedi. I was a little bit disappointed. Yeah. That, well, and that was a huge creative risk, right? Like we, yeah. and we debated that for a long time. So, you know, again, part of my role in that game was to represent Star Wars and to say this is what we think we want to do with the license in, in the context of this game. Um, and, and, you know, SOE, not take away anything from them. SOE was very focused on how do we make a successful massively multiplayer online game. And, you know, the designers that were working on it really wanted to kind of take some risk creatively under the kind of, and I hate to say it this way, but under kind of the protection of the Star Wars license, right? It's like we knew a certain number of people were going to come play the game because it was Star Wars. So because they wanted to, yeah. So things like, you know, and, uh, you know, the city building, um, the entertainer class, the way that we handled Jedi. There were a lot of things in that game that nobody has since even kind of come close to matching in other MMOs, but they were really risky. And I think in hindsight, it's 2020, right? I think some of it came out at the expense of combat. You know, combat wasn't as satisfying as it probably should have been for a Star Wars game. Um, it was an MMO, though. Well. I mean, yeah, it did right. everything that you wanted an MMO to do. Yeah. In my opinion, anyway. I mean, it was yeah. very, it was very crunchy. <laughs> I love that game. I mean, I still have such fond memories of that game. And, and you ever and get is, on any of the any of the, the servers that are hosting it? No, the fan servers. I haven't. Yeah. I'm, I'm almost like it's almost like I because I have some PTSD too. And there's like, you know, you kind of remember how hard it was to burp that game. Um, oh and, my god, how does that? Oh, yeah. I you know I'm jealous of everything I read. You have like this career that's a pretty amazing. I mean, Thanks. like like five freaking awesome things on there that blow you away, and that's been your entire life. I mean, PTSD working on these great franchises, one being Star Wars. Yeah, What's it's like? well, it's funny. It's just because I mean, and and I I've never made a film, right? So I don't know yeah. what the comparison is. I mean, someday I'd like to go do that just so I can almost say like, you know, what's harder? Or how how is it different? You know? Yeah. But making games, man, is just it's it's one of the I I can only imagine it's one of the most difficult things you can do creatively because you're dealing with this intersection of technology and art and that's that's super exciting but it's always super challenging and it's really technology is really unpredictable right it's sometimes really difficult to gauge how long it's going to take to to you know um realize the tech that you need to build but then you know just making a game fun and the number of iterations you have to go through and you know the experimentation and prototyping that you have to do um that's like a, a kind of a weird you know kind of almost dark art as well that like and then bringing those two things together is always really challenging. And, and, but the reason I'm still doing it is because it is super challenging and super fun. And I get to work with, you know, teams of really inspired and creative people. And, you know, I get, I learned like, there's no joke. I learned something every single day. What are you guys, uh, what are you guys working on now? So we're working on a, a new game that I can't talk about at all. So, oh. <laughs> yeah. So we got, you know, hangar 13 wrapped up mafia three. Um, we did DLC for it as well, which, um, is some of the the best content in the game actually is some of the stuff that we did um as part of the the kind of downloadable content um you know kind of continued the storyline and, and added some new features which uh is always really nice to do um and then since then we've been working on a new project um that you know will leverage our strengths um we're obviously you know we built kind of a a, a big content rich game and and really focused heavily on narrative um, which obviously given my background is something I want to continue to do. So mm -hmm. we'll focus on that, um, as well, but, uh, and then try and, you know, for me, everything's a learning experience. So no matter how well something's received, I always look at it and try and dissect it and say, what can we do better? And certainly there's room for improvement with mafia three. So we're looking at, you know, how do we mess around with game structures and kind of new and innovative ways and, and solve some of the problems we have with repetition in, in mafia three. How do we do a better job telling story? Because even though that was a real strength of the game, we want to tell story better um, and, uh, you know, keep pushing kind of on that. Uh, and then, how you know, do we can we kind of push the systemic depth of the game and, and give you more reasons to, to keep playing? Um, so we're play, game? That. play video games. What's that? Do you play games? Like, oh, yeah. 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 Oh, that's I play it. What you, what's your fit what's going on right now in terms of are you an xbox dude are you a playstation guy or are you the ultimate fed, fighting champion and have a pc rig no i well so i have all i have all three um okay. i you know part of that is a uh, again a byproduct of my job where i feel like i have to play a lot of different games on a lot i tell of my wife the same too. thing babe, i gotta do it yeah. i have to play these games <laughs> yeah um but i 
you know, I, and I kind of go back and forth. I go through phases depending on what games are out, whether I like <laughs> that, you know, it's almost embarrassing to admit this, but I, you know, I spent like a huge chunk of the last month playing uh, Planet Coaster on PC, you know, which is a stimulation. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I do but that. That's a builder, though. I mean, people yeah. admit to playing Farm Simulator. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, people are playing some crazy things out there that you wouldn't think are video games. That why Trucker fan, uh, Simulator? Yeah. Really? The and that's the thing that's really exciting for me being in the industry too. Is you look at the way in which the industry has evolved over time. Yeah. Um, so you know, Planet Coaster is a is a kind of spiritual successor to Roller Coaster Tycoon, which came out years and years and years ago, and I was addicted to then too. And I find that I get really addicted to the games that are very different from the ones that I build um, because I have to kind of cast a wide net with those other, you know, I, I play every third person action game out there. I play every oh, yeah. story driven game I play just because I, I learn from all those, right. And apply it back to what I'm, you know, what I'm working on, but it feels like, even with the best games, it feels kind of like homework, right? Because I'm dissecting it to try and figure out well, what can I learn from this game? What did they do well? What did they do poorly? Where can I learn? A game like, you know, Planet I'm, not, I'm probably not going to ever work on a game. No, like I was that, just right? going to argue with you and say, you know, I'm a writer and I read for pleasure, but I don't really read for pleasure anymore. I read a first sentence and wonder how this guy got published. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so, how this happen? Yeah. It's not a tragedy necessarily, <laughs> but uh, why is he in this stupid book and why am I reading yeah. him? Oh no! Well, but no I've I, gotten to the point now where I just stop. Like with re, if I get to a book, into a book and it's bad, I just stop. Like you know, I just don't. Even you stop, it, but is it bad? Right? That's yeah, where I'm yeah. at. Maybe this wasn't bad. I pick it up yeah. again. But I have like yeah. 50 books balanced on my Kindle right now, and they're yeah. all like in the same place where I can't get into them. Right. Video games are kind of the same way. I'm playing Torment, Planescape right now. Oh yeah, I love that game so much. Yeah. And you know what's his uh, Pillars of Eternity just came yeah. out. That one, I love that yeah. style of game very very yeah. much. Um, but the third party shooters are, are fun, but I don't know. There are a lot of them out there. They seem to be cloning themselves over and over again. And the story, does it matter ultimately? Do you think the, do you think writers are really investing themselves in these video games or is it more an engineering feat and the writing kind of just flows around with the engineers have already built? No, it, I mean, I think it all depends on the studio and the game. Um, certainly with mafia three. And uh, everything I've worked on, you know, in, in kind of a principal role. So something like Force Unleashed, something like Mafia Three, the story has been hugely important. And we first, or as you're going, it's so in the ideal world they evolve side by side, right? And that's really? yeah, so and, frustrating though. I mean, how do you do yeah. that? Not know it's where really you're hard. Ultimately, yeah. I mean, it's a lot of give and take, a lot of back and forth. I'm, you know, looking at something like I'll give an example, going all the way back to Force Unleashed, where. We knew we wanted to do the very first concept was, um, well, we had a lot of ideas that ultimately led to the Force Unleashed. But once we kind of settled on, we're going to do a game that's focusing on a Jedi character. Um, I knew the, the, the kind of first pieces that came together were the setting, which is set, you know, between episodes three and episode four, the main character, which is the, the idea of Darth Vader's secret apprentice. So we didn't know the story, know. but we knew the character. And then the idea that the like, um, it was so much fun to play. Yeah. So, th and that all came from the gameplay of being kind of the force being over the top and, you know, kind of the, again, the force unleashed, right. And we didn't have the name yet, but we knew that we wanted that to kind of be the, um, the, the feel that you got from the game. So we had those three things. And then we started working on prototyping all the force powers and how the force would work and this kind of third person action, it's very Game interesting engine, because that yeah. was the that was kind of the complaint about galaxies, wasn't it? Is that you wanted to feel like a Jedi, you wanted to fight yeah. with Jedi powers, and you yeah. really have that mash a button, wait for the mechanic to go, mash yeah. another button, you right. know, cooldowns, do their little timer thing. But when Force uh, the Force uh, um, Unleashed came out, you actually felt like you were doing th stuff as a Jedi. Yeah, it's a difference. I, between... I think that was the first time ever a game was developed like that. I don't think there was ever a game that made you feel like you were a Jedi. <laughs> well, so we had we had done other ones at LucasArts where, you know, we had Jedi, uh, the whole Jedi Knight series and, and Jedi Academy. But those were those were based on kind of a, a first person shooter engine. And it started that way with Dark Forces. Um, and then we had, uh, you know, we did some other things with Jedi along the way. And but Force Unleashed was really where we were like, we're going to take the gloves off and we're going to go. We're going to we're going to break from the films and and really kind of push what you can do with the force because it's a video game and a lot of that again came from kind of permission we got from george and from lucasfilm to say look this is a different a different medium 
you know, so it's okay for us to kind of push things in a way that maybe, you know, you wouldn't see in the films, just like the comics are a different medium, right? So, um, yeah. So that was really kind of liberating. Still really good, us. though. And it's another great example of how the Star Wars universe pulls you in no matter what. Yeah. Well, and again, it's because, you know, it's a, and, and I tell the guys here all the time when we're working on games, it's like the, your first job is actually to create a world. And it, it should be a world that suggests endless stories, right? And then we will figure out the story that goes in that world. But that that's really kind of been my approach to a, a lot of stuff that I worked on. And, and, and mostly because of learning that. You look at Star Wars, you're like, well, I, you can literally tell endless stories. You want to tell yeah. a story about pirates? You can tell – they happen to be space pirates, but you can tell you a really pirate can. story, right? Like, it's so crazy. Does it frustrate you? Because, I mean, ultimately, you are in George Lucas' issues right now, right? You're creating, you know – boundless content you can go in any direction that you want with what you have and he stepped into those shoes and made a movie right, right. and it just it made that thing happen for him yeah. in 1976 or whatever 1977 yeah <laughs> i don't know i mean it's like that analog versus digital thing but in an extreme case I and mean, he defined the entire remaining portion of the 20th century only making three films basically well, for sure. But, and, but again, I think we mentioned this earlier and, and this is why he was such an inspiration for me and in, in wanting to kind of be that in that, that kind of focal point of creative production and business is that when you think of all the stuff that he touched, it, it goes well beyond just those three films. Right. So with Indiana Jones, even something like Willow, right? Like I look at that. Yeah, like, man, you keep yeah. mentioning these names. I'm like, dude, yeah. that was a badass movie. And you yeah. know, you know, you cannot forget to mention toys. Because I'm right. a 41 year old man, and if my wife loved me, I would have every single Star Wars toy ever made. Yeah, you know those little 3.5 plastic things. I mean, they are my childhood. I love them. I want them all. Right. How, what the hell is that? You know what I mean? And, and again, I and I think and I think part of it is that 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 notion that he's he was able to create this world that that you know again supports endless stories. So I think for me, just as a creative, I look at that and go that that to me is the ultimate goal. Right. It's not. It's yeah. not even just one story. It's that. And you no. look at, you know, the Harry Potter franchise is another really great example. Yeah, of that, really right? great Where, example of that. Like, yeah, I can imagine endless stories set in that, in that world, in that, that setting, you know, um, whereas, you know, you look other things and, and I'm actually like, and again, as much as I love Stephen King, it's like, until yeah, you start to read thing, all, all of it. Yeah. But you don't know that until you start to read all of his books and you realize, oh, They're all kind of connected. They, they all kind of <laughs> connect. Right. And so, and I don't yeah. know if you ever set out to do that, but like, that to me is 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 fascinating. And Marvel obviously is is huge. Oh my god, forget about it. What they're and, yeah. what they're doing right now in movies is historic. It's amazing, honestly, to have you know being alive to witness what they're doing, honestly, with this continuing storyline. I, I and I I am continually blown away. Like that to me right now is the other than maybe some of the stuff like like I'm I'm fascinated with like Disney theme parks and the way that those are evolving over time and yeah, just in general, what's going on with star Wars, but like the Marvel stuff is incredible because of that, because of that. It does itch yeah. that thing. Doesn't it, that we're talking about Disney Marvel yeah. Legos kind of looking yeah. at they Lego capitalizes on all those worlds. Yeah. I mean, you, you dangled your feet in the waters of an existing franchise with mafia, right? One and yeah. two, you didn't have anything to do with those games, right? No, so and what was interesting is I I had never even played either of them when I first started working on Mafia Three, and obviously immediately went and looked at and played both of them and and tried to immerse myself in in Mafia, which is kind of it wasn't that unfamiliar to me because and again this is one of those things that I think people are already surprised to hear, but when I first started Lucas Arts, I wasn't a huge Star Wars fan in the sense that like I hadn't read every single book i'd seen all the movies <laughs> that's what makes it, a fan though because i haven't done yeah. that either those books well, are pretty bad and like the majority of them are horrible yeah i mean well at the time there was the thrawn trilogy and stuff which yeah, again, that I, I, yeah i went back and i reread that so when i started lucas arts there had been a lot but there hadn't been obviously hadn't been as much as, as they would do over the next 10 15 years right but like when i when i first started there i i you know i couldn't i if you had asked me what the name of uh, you know Boba Fett's ship was, I couldn't. I probably couldn't have told you. Slave one. You know, it's like, yeah, exactly, slave one. Right? <laughs> yeah. So, well, this is funny because my, <laughs> my first job there was as a contract writer working on an encyclopedia, and my roommate oh. at the time was a crazy Star Wars nerd, right? And so he actually he had got up to leave to go to work, you know, uh, before I had to go leave to go to this interview. And when I woke up, I walked around our apartment, and he had put post-it notes all over the apartment. 
with tri- with Star Wars trivia questions, right? Like uh, like twenty or thirty of them, right? So I go to the interview. The interview goes really well. I'm like, they're not going to ask me trivia questions. That's kind of tacky, right? Like, but at the end, the the project lead comes in and he's like, oh, he's like, we weren't going to ask you to do this because we thought it was kind of tacky, but you did so well in the interview. We just kind of want to understand your depth of Star Wars knowledge. So they gave me like ten, uh, like a ten question quiz, and I swear, like seven of the ten of those questions. I would not have known had my roommate not, you know, left those post-it notes around. <laughs> and cool. one of them was, you know, the, the name of Boba Fett's ship was Slave One, right? So, um, you know, so I got 10 out of 10 and I ended up getting the job. But I, I really had to immerse myself in Star Wars and go back. And again, I was familiar with the films, but I had to go back and read, you know, not just books, but like RPG source books. And, you know, because there had been a whole RPG and, you know, the comics and, and, you know, try and catch up on everything over the course of a couple months. Um, so it wasn't that different. I mean, it was a bigger scope because Star Wars yeah. is much larger in terms of the number of sources than maybe Mafia wanted to. But, you know, going back and kind of how do I immerse myself in this this IP and, and kind of get to understand it um, and understand what people want. But then also, how do we put a spin on it? And, and that's what we, you know, with Mafia 3, we were like, we got to do something. We didn't want to just do, you know, the Italian mob again because that, that had been done to death not just in games, but in, you know, felt like in film and everywhere else. So we well, it's been to done well too, on. right? I mean, some yeah. absolute classic storytelling took place with the Sopranos and the Godfather. Right. Yeah, we'll call yeah. it the trilogy. We'll add so, the third one. And just because the first two were so good. Right. Right. And that's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> with the Godfather for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we tried to take a lot of inspiration from something like the second half of Goodfellas and, and some oh, other God, that you was know, kind of harder Bob films, but then, you know, for not me, played really... any mafia, but it looks incredibly interesting. Like when I see it pop up, it it, it looks intriguing. Um, yeah, it was it was a, again a real labor of love for us, and I think um, we tried to. Uh, I I feel like you're not going to be successful in this industry because it's so competitive without taking creative risk. And with Mafia Three, we're like, okay, we're going to set the game in the late '60s. Uh, it's actually set in '68, the, the year my my dad came back from Vietnam, so that was you know really meaningful for us. And then um, we, you know, we have an African-American protagonist in the game, which, again, is, you know, uh, we're telling that story, you know, in the 60s with a Vietnam vet who's, you know, returning from from Vietnam and gets engaged or gets, you know, kind of wrapped up in this kind of mob story. So um, creatively, there were a lot of risks, I think, that we kind of took, um, but they all paid off because you know, the, the story in particular was really well received. So. Yeah. Um, so are you ever going to go back into that world or can you even talk about it at this point? I can't talk about that. Yeah, no, I mean, I would love to just because uh, again, I think that there are still hundreds of crime stories that you can tell. And that's the thing that again, even with mafia three, we were like, okay, we want to be true to mafia one and two. And we want to reference the history that they created there. And, there are characters from Mafia Two that are referenced and show up in Mafia Three, and um, we we try and you know kind of uh, harken back to that. But we were also trying to now expand it and, and create a whole world, right? So um, you know we added a new city that is kind of new to the fiction and set up kind of different re- or new relationships with the crime families and brought the government into it and did a lot of other things that I think uh, would allow us to kind of have a, a strong foundation for for again, telling more stories in this universe. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you can't talk about what you're currently doing, but not you're... here at Hangar 13. No. Yeah. yeah. Uh, are you, are you satisfied having gone into video games with your writing? Would you have preferred to do like the traditional Michael Crichton type of literary career? Or are you still kind of working on that too? Kind of at the same time, or can you even develop the energy to do that at the same time? No, I'm still working on it. So again, I'm always torn, right? And this is, you know, it's it's always hard because I think if my dad gave me this piece of advice when I got, I was so excited when I got my job at LucasArts, right? And then, you know, again, it was right after I'd written those two books and, and the publishing industry was kind of, the, the traditional print publishing industry was kind of falling on hard times. And I was like, okay, well, maybe I need to look at other avenues for storytelling and I, and that's what's really exciting to me is finding new ways to tell stories. So that's why games was so interesting to me. And I'd always been a gamer growing up. So, you know, being yeah. able to kind of work on, on that in that field and kind of try it out um, was something really interesting to me. But again, it was supposed to be a six-month gig. It was just going to be a contract gig. And then I was going to go do something else. 
and I ended up being there for, you know, 13 years. Uh, but my dad, when I first started was like, just don't stop writing your own stuff. And I, I do yeah. wish that I had listened to him a little bit more oh. and, and done more of my own stuff at that time when you have, you know, so my like boundless in, energy and optimism and you're, yeah. you're too stupid to know what, what is possible. <laughs> and, you know, you don't that have kids. Stupid kid that, is still you know. inside you. You just have to dig. Yeah. Well, and that's, so I think, um, but, but the flip side to that is that I, I wrote, you know, I won a Writers Guild of America award for writing you know, <sighs> the, the Force Unleashed. I met the guys at Dark Horse largely through, you know, my work on, on Star Wars games and my whole comic book career. Yeah, you've I had an awesome those guys career. Were. I'm just so, I'm incredibly jealous of what you've put together in terms of, you know, these really awesome things. Your work flavored my mid twenties all the way through my mid thirties, basically. Uh, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> every time I turn around, there was, a, yeah. there was a product that you developed yeah. in my life. And that's been yeah. pretty cool. And that's pretty cool thinking that I got, now I'm talking to you on the, I didn't realize yeah. that you were that person then, but I mean, yeah, your work, I mean, you work in a team. That's yeah. what you do. You go to work and you work in an environment with a bunch of cool people get together and talk about cool stuff. And then you make something cool. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's kind of the gist of it with games for sure. And it's all, you know, I, I'd like to think I, you know, I have a pretty big hand in all the stuff that we do, but at the end of the day, like good ideas can come from anywhere. And part of my job is to foster that and to make sure that, you know, people are feel like they can share and they can collaborate. Um, but then the reason I do the other stuff is because it is different, right? Like working on comics is an absolute collaboration, but with a much, much smaller group. Right. And in general, it's you and, and the artist. So, you know, I've, I've been really fortunate to work with some really great artists over my career in yeah. comics, but you know, Jim Williams, J.H. Williams, the third, like he's phenomenal. And work on some pretty you know. freaking good comics too. I mean, it, you, so, yeah. it's interesting. You played for both both teams too. You got traded to the the good guys and the bad guys. Actually, I like them both fine. DC and Marvel. Yeah. Oh right. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that was really great too. Like so to be able. I mean, I love Dark Horse and like again, Dark. They were fantastic because they were the first, you know, kind of folks to give me a shot and to let me write some stuff. Um, but working with Dark Horse is very different than working with DC, which was very different than working with Marvel. So I learned. And then now I'm, I'm working with Image on this new book called Echo Lands that I'm doing with, with Jim Williams. And <sighs> that's very different too, right? And so like, um, but, but that collaboration is so much more, it, again, it's, it's got pros and cons and it's very, you know, you compare and contrast it to working on games, right? But like the relationship or that collaboration on comics is so much more intimate than it is in games because you're not dealing with a, a you know a large team of, of dozens or even hundreds in some cases of people you're dealing with you know usually like one or two or three other you know the 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 the, the pencil or the inker the Egos colors are harder letter, right? I imagine in a smaller group because they want to they want to stick out I, you they know, want their I answers i don't know like I, again i've been really for and not to say that i don't have an ego and jim doesn't have an ego and and we <sighs> you know again we 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 never clash because that would be a lie we do clash sometimes but it's all but it's all really good creative churn right and like what comes out at the other end is is Success. always stronger because yeah. of that right and i think it's because we respect each other and we get along really well and we're friends outside of the collaboration but i've been really lucky again because a lot of the artists in, that i've worked with have been like okay you know what this is your vision what do you want to do but at the same time they've been able to say okay you know, this is what I'm good at. Can you let me off the rain or let me off the leash and let me really focus on what I'm good at? Like, you know, I, I did a, um, a lecture with Mike Del Mundo and he's fantastic and really kinetic. And so I was like, well, what do you want to do? He's like, well, I want to do some big monsters. I was like, all right, well, what would happen if Electra went to Monster Island, right? Like, let's do that. Story, <laughs> you know? Because he, you know, and so it was a really good, but I would have never thought to do that had I not talked to him and he's like, well, I, I would love to do more, you know, tell a story with monsters, right? Like, you know, that's cool monsters. Though, Cause you're not, I mean, I obviously work in the dark. Am I working right. on something good? Or right. am I totally, working yeah. a whole freaking year of my life? You know what I mean? You get to talk to somebody on an endless basis. Am, is this good? Are you sure right. this is good? Yeah. The reassurance must be so freaking awesome. Well, it all, it all depends. Right. Cause there's also then those times where you're like, dude, I just want to do my thing and not have to rely on anybody. Right. And that's, so that's why I continue to write other stuff too. And, you know, I write screenplays and I write novels and I do other things that I just mostly just for me now at this point and, and trying to figure out what I want to do with this stuff down the line. But, um, the, you know, what kind because of you writing? want to scratch that itch too, right. Of like, look, I don't care. 
this is this is for nobody but for me or i i usually have somebody in my head that i'm writing for that they may never see it but i'm like you know are, are you that's still doing totally genre stuff thing. like you are you still yeah. doing genre you are yeah. yeah yeah for sure like i just i don't know why i mean for me that's just where my passion is and it's always the you know the the type it's of stuff most fun place to play i mean you could yeah. play wherever you want or you could do there whatever no you want it's awesome well, and, that, really and that's and I always talk about this too, because people ask me like, what's the biggest difference between working in games and comics and then, you know, like fiction and, and having written all of it, I, I look at it and I go, well, you know, in games, the, the, the big deal with games is that you're dealing with tech constraints, you're dealing with budget constraints and not just budget in terms of like of money, but like how much art can I put on screen? That's a budget, right? Like, and mm-hmm. I have to, I have to think about that. Um, and so you can't, it's hard, you know, you're not going to create a story like force unleashed. I think we went to like six planets or something like that, but that, that was crazy because the, again, you're creating all new art sets for that. It, it, it is really, you know, it's gorgeous. Game too. Oh, thanks. Yeah. We were, hard. yeah. <laughs> well, that was really- yeah. And, and, and again, galaxies was the same way where we went to a number of different planets and we had some tech that allowed us to kind of generate those planets. I would get in a land speeder but... on Tatooine and just yeah. go, I mean, Drive you would see Yeah. It's crazy. That, so, is there any way that LucasArts would bring that game back? I don't, you know, I don't know. I, I, I've no, and again, I don't know exactly what their, you know, future plans are for any of that stuff. I think, you know, they've got other people obviously that are building games in, in the Star Wars universe now. EA is doing some stuff. That, um, well, the, so, the community, as far as I know, it does not appreciate what EA is putting out. I did not play the battle Battlefield. Is it Battlefield? No, it's not. What it's called? Uh, Battlefront. It's about, yeah. Battlefront. Yeah. Did not play um, that, unfortunately. Not but one because I don't have a. a uh, what's it called the console but number two man everybody hated it <laughs> the idea of wasn't it that one or was it something else uh I, i'm not sure because again I've, I've been trying to kind of uh be dip, as diplomatic as possible with the star wars stuff because i have such a you know my connection to it is so oh i see unique right so it's like i don't want to be too ju- it's like going to see the movies right like i don't want to be too judgmental like oh i would have done it this way Instead, I just try and sit back and enjoy it because it's 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 a franchise that I love and it's a universe that I love playing in and and that I love you know seeing new stories told in. So, I I try and separate the kind of Hayden as a Star Wars creator and Hayden as a Star Wars fan That's as so much cool. as possible and like just kind of enjoy it and and see it through the eyes of my kids and stuff like that. So um, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm a fan you know, obviously of the work that you do. I freaking love that comic. Um, <laughs> the Bigfoot comic that was so amazingly inventive, and you know I got I was I'll, scheduled talking to you. I'm thinking oh you know whatever people cancel sometimes. I'm not gonna get to talk to them whatever. Right. I am you know a fan of that piece of work, and I start working looking at everything else that you've developed, and I realize I'm a fan of most of the stuff that you built, and I think it's pretty freaking cool that I got to talk to somebody who developed for Star Wars. Oh thanks, you know, I appreciate I mean, that. I'm like yeah. Out on the inside that I got to talk to you on my podcast, and I get to share you with my listeners. Yeah. I think that's fantastic. And we are working on about an hour right now too. Yeah. So, um, I I want to ask you three questions. Yeah, sure, go um, for it. The two of them are normal. The third one's new and unique to All you. Right. Have you have you met George Lucas? Uh, yeah. I mean, I was really fortunate to um be in quite a few meetings with him. Um, <laughs> it was always fascinating. You know the the. I try and learn from everybody, right? right. So, you know, I, I sit there and try and absorb some of the stuff that... This guy's going to live know, a long drop. time in the history of humanity. For sure, yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, what yeah. I mean, what what insights did you gather by watching him? And what would you, like, I mean, express to people well, that he is successful because of blank? So, I think, again, I would look at it and go, and for me, my kind of career path was really shaped by the fact that I looked at him as a... Uh, you know, unique person in the sense that he was able to sit at that nexus between creative production and business. <clears throat> so I've always tried to kind of foster that and, and understand understand enough about the business, understand enough about the production realities um, in order to kind of <clears throat> allow me to be a more successful creative. And I think that was, again, a lot of, he was very inspirational from that, that standpoint. Um, yeah. I think, you know, I also went into my and I still looking back, not sure if this was a good thing or not, but even my first meeting with him, I knew that I was going to meet with him and we were talking about a bunch of different games that were on kind of the LucasArts slate. And I was, I was there to represent one or two specific ones with star Wars, but ended up being there for the whole, whole meeting. Um, and I think I went in there going, I'm not going to, you know, I, I kind of 
he's just a guy, right? So I just want to go have a conversation with like, he's just, yes, he's George Lucas, but at the end of the day, he's just a guy, right? And like, I, I don't know if that actually served me well or not, because I, I never had that sense of, like, I wasn't nervous going into that first meeting with him. I didn't walk in with kind of a sense of awe. I didn't, you know, um, so on the one hand, I think it made it, it made it a little easier for me personally when I had to talk about the stuff I had to talk about. Yeah. I, I was a little bit more confident because I'm like, well, I'm just I'm just talking to like my dad or a guy like I just, you know, and I don't mean that because of the age thing. Like my, you know, my dad's just a normal dude. Right. Um, but at the same time, I don't know that, you know, there are probably things that I said that maybe I shouldn't have. And like because I was really young. Right. And like I probably stepped in it a few times or I was like, oh. You know, he, he probably thinks I'm an idiot because I said this thing, right? And, you know, looking back in hindsight, but, um, but the the one, the the other thing I would say that made him really successful is again that idea that he created this universe that supported multiple stories. Um, I think he never How gave up. He was super tenacious. He, you know, he wasn't planning on doing that though, as far as the lore goes, right? I mean, that was an accident. He just wanted to make movies and Star Wars was yeah. just another movie that he was making at that particular time. Yeah, I don't know. Again, I don't know that he set out to say, hey, I'm going to create this big franchise. And in fact, right. the story goes, and I don't know if this is apocryphal or not, but the story goes, he wanted to do a Flash Gordon movie and yeah. he couldn't get the rights. It was too expensive. So he's like, well, I'm just going to go do my own. And I think that again is another one where you're like, well, the guy was just super tenacious. And like, he didn't, he didn't give up. He didn't know, you know, um, he knew enough to kind of push people. But like ILM, that's another thing. It's like, he started that to make Star Wars. You're like, that's yeah. crazy. Like, looking it's back crazy. in hindsight, you're like, oh my God, he created a whole VFX. Like, he wasn't a visual effects guy. Like, he, no, he but you know, you know what, man? I'm wearing a Star Wars t shirt right now. And exactly. Because of you. Yeah. And I just happened yeah. to be wearing a Star Wars t shirt. Yeah. But, you know, I'm not wearing a, um, what was that movie he did before Star Wars with? Oh, no, THQ. Uh, or, yeah, I mean, sorry, THX, uh, THX, or, THX, sorry, THX. Yeah, I'm not wearing a THX shirt or whatever yeah. that car racing movie. I'm not wearing that type American of shirt either. Graffiti, I'm wearing Star Wars. Yeah. I mean, yeah. damn, and the guy, I mean, the lore says he's lucky, but you're right. How do you get lucky to be a billionaire like that? Well, and what is it? Luck is, is you know, one part opportunity and one part preparation, right? So it's like, yeah. he, you know, I, I, I look at it and just go, he, he, he would have been successful no matter what in my mind because he had this kind of, he had this drive and this singular vision and, and really knew what he wanted. And I think that's, that's important. Um, but then I also like, I mean, he was just fun to talk to sometimes. Like we were, you know, talking about um, one point, you know, the importance of humor and, and he, he, he brought it up and we were talking about, I can't remember what the context that we might've been talking about force unleashed and, or something at, at the time, but um, you know, and he's looking at it going, look, all the, the, the franchises that have been successful at that time, they all had, some level of humor, you know, and Star Wars and Harry Potter and, you know, even I think the, the Nolan Batmans were big at this time. And even that had kind of uh, its own kind of sense of humor. And, and when you look at some of the other franchises kind of fail or fall away, you're like, yeah, maybe, you know, they don't they don't have that moment of levity. And then I tie it back to would you want to build these worlds that people want to live in and they want to save. Right. Especially when you're talking about building a game. But like I, as a kid, I wanted to go live in the Star Wars universe. I wanted to go live in the Marvel universe. These were places that you're like, I, you know, you wanted to go save them. Right. So you wanted to read stories about people saving them. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and you have to have the, like, there's gotta be a, a reason to smile in a world like that, or a character you want to go hang out with and have a beer. Right. Which is why it's so important to have a character like Han Solo in that franchise or, you know, the, the, the twin brothers and, and, the Harry Potter franchise. I want to go hang out with those guys, right? Like those. You know. One's a ghost right now, though, unfortunately. And spoiler yeah. Well, yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, but that was tragic. Like I, that. That actually, when I read that book, that actually hit me harder than any of the other characters that died because I was like, oh my god. Like, I mean, Lupin. I wanted to go hang out with Lupin too because he's a werewolf, the right? Like, <laughs> dead, man. Everybody yeah. died. They really did. Right. The Harry Potter right. even died at the end. Yeah, and came back, but. Um, that, that, what a great! I mean, she wasn't supposed to get published. She got denied no. hundreds of times. Right. George Lucas was supposed to get ripped off of Star Wars, but he ended up with the toy rights. I yeah. mean, this just yeah. crazy stories how reality works out. Yeah, Couldn't and you can say some, a million years. You can say something that was the time period, right? Because there had never been a big blockbuster like the first, the one before that was Jaws, right? But obviously, Jaws. I mean, although they did end up doing toys and things like that with Jaws, Jaws is a different type of movie, right? You're not. You're not marketing to the same group and you're not, you know, 
you're not expecting nine year olds to go see Jaws and then get excited about getting a shark action figure or whatever, right? Well, did not I, Close Encounters that. make more money than Star Wars? And Steven Spielberg actually has a percentage of Star Wars because of a bet George Lucas the, and he had about I the box office. I think if I recall, it's because it's the flip where they, this is what I recall. And again, you'd have to fact check the story, but is that those two guys were sitting on a beach talking about In their, Hawaii. the movies that were about, <laughs> yeah, that were about to come out. And they, or that they were working on. And basically, George thought Close Encounters was going to be a bigger success than Star Wars and vice versa. So they bet that the other one's movie was going to be more successful. Oh, I see. And whoever won would pay, give a percentage of the, the, the you know, give some royalty to the, to the other guys. So because Star Wars was, you know, Spielberg was convinced Star Wars was going to be a bigger hit than Close Encounters. It was. It made more money. Spielberg got some money off the back. And that's I think that. Happened, but, I don't know. I if think that's, that's the biggest lesson to learn from the entire George Lucas legend: <laughs> is surround yourself yeah. with incredibly intelligent people, well, right? His right, wife, yeah. yeah, Steven Spielberg. Yeah. Who was the director that he always went to? He's famous too. I think he did um, Redacted. Uh, well, Brian Cop- I know Coppola. You know, Coppola was a guy that he yeah. hung out with, and that they, yeah. you know, um, you know, he kind of took Ron Howard, I think, under his wing a little bit. That's the story I heard, right? So it's like, but again, being part of that creative brain trust and again i don't know how this is how apocryphal this is or not but like the story i heard there with the with this original screening of star wars so he did you know he did a screening of star wars it wasn't finally it wasn't the final edit yet he still had a lot of um shots in that were um like old footage from um uh you know that he had lifted from other films like war films and stuff just to kind of give the idea of this is going to be a dogfight in space so let's take a bunch of dogfight footage and put it in there so it wasn't wasn't the final film but he got a bunch of of other directors together that he respected and they all watched the movie and afterwards they all kind of panned it except for spielberg and spielberg was like this is going to be a huge hit you know once once it's all finally done so he kind of got the vision and and saw it so i think opening yourself up to that type of feedback is really important but then also knowing like when you have a vision and being like well it's going to succeed or fail but it's going to be mine and i'm going to i'm going to keep pushing forward with it i think is important too right so like you know and that's that's always. I mean, tough how balance, much right? does Michael Crichton play into what you write on a daily basis, even now today? Do you think back on those marks on that paper and go, Jesus Christ, I can't oh, do you that mean, again? Um, Dean, yeah. Dean Co- well, Dean Coons. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, Dean Coons for sure. Michael Crichton, I apologize. I no, think we for went sure. from, to Michael Crichton eventually, but yeah, I mean, how, yeah. how does he haunt your writing now? Right, still. It does. It doesn't. It does. I mean, again, I, I, I. The one, like on the positive side, like when people will con- like, I, you know, people will reach out to me periodically and say, Hey, can I talk to you and get some career advice or I'm, I'm 15 or whatever. And I want to become a writer. I want to write comics or want to work in games or whatever. Can you give me advice? And I always try and make time for that because, mm-hmm. because that guy made time for me. Right. And like kind of gave me, and, and to be fair, gave me kind of a kick in the ass. Right. Which I thought was good in hindsight. Right. But th- and then the flip side of it is that he, he, it was my first brush of like, real critical feedback and i'm sure if i i still have the story i wrote i don't think i have his notes i gotta go back and look i don't think i have his his his, you know kind of margin written notes but i still have the story i wrote and if i go back and reread it i'm sure it's terrible right and i'm sure that all the feedback was really was that amazing right to destroy a kid and it probably was kind you know what i mean you wanted to hear one thing and one thing only let me give you money for Uh, the story (laughs) no that's what i wanted yeah i wanted to hear let me introduce you to my agent right right oh my god let me make you let me give you some of my fame kid here yeah you're you're a prodigy you're gonna be writing horror novels by the time you're 16 right like yeah anything short of that in your little boy fantasy world wasn't gonna match up you know what i mean exactly right right so but but it was good because then you get to college and you're like okay now you're you're one of you know several people you know again i i was maybe one of the and I, I don't know if i was the best but i was one of the you know better writers at my high school probably right and and i got into this creative writing program at at uc santa cruz but you're like oh well now you're you're also in there with you know the the kind of best writers from all their high schools right so yeah like, so you're like oh okay i'm now i'm kind of one of the i'm, I'm in the pack right and 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 again, if anybody that takes creative writing classes, like the whole point of that is to kind of tear you down to build you back up. I mean, it's, yeah. And and I because I had kind of gone had that at least that first taste of it um, with uh, his little story or his comments on my little story. Like it was a little bit easier for me when I got into these classes to be like, okay, 
I'm, I'm getting real critical feedback that this is to make me better. And then that was really helpful because, you know, the games industry in particular, like, I mean, people are savage, right? Like they, you know, yeah. they don't pull any punches. So you're like, God, man. you got to be able to read a review and go, well, okay, that, you know, that's hyperbole, but that, but there's a nugget. What of truth are they really that, saying? Yeah. I mean, what yeah. can I use? Yeah. That's really right. cool. Yeah. So. And, and so it's being able to talk to you, man. This is really yeah. fantastic. And that was the one question. So the second yeah. one actually was a lot easier. Um, what What are you consuming right now, like book wise, movie wise? Uh, God, everything. So I just I've been on. What would you terror. recommend people take a look at? Yeah. So I, I'm I'm reading The Terror right now uh, by Dan Simmons, which okay. yeah, um, I I've had it sitting on my shelf for a really long time, but they are doing a TV series uh, right now um that uh, has it might actually just ended but uh there's a there is a tv series so i wanted to watch the series but i wanted to read the book first um so i'm reading that and i'm tearing it's huge but i'm tearing through that that's been really good um i read stephen king's revival just recently um which uh i actually quite enjoyed because you know uh he's it's a first person uh, which he doesn't do very often yeah, as do far so as i can person at all yeah, and and it's very uh, it's this guy's kind of biography, and and um, it's a really interesting story, and and you know again it takes a Stephen King twist for sure, but um, that was really good. Um, and then um, I just got read uh, I just read uh, what is it Killers of the Flower Moon, which is a nonfiction book about um, murders of um, Osage Indians um, and the kind of founding of the the early days of the FBI. And that was fascinating because there's so much history there that I didn't know and didn't realize, like some of the, the ways that, uh, you know, Native Americans were treated and some of the, the laws that were in place were just so onerous. Um, and, I bet everybody uh, on the yeah. FBI was uh, honorable and not racist at all. Yeah, I know. It's definitely <laughs> a mix. I mean, there is one character, the character, I mean, it's, again, it's not a real person there, that lived and died. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there is, a, there is a guy that is kind of... Um, uh, kind of a, a, a Texas FBI agent who is kind of chafing under the um, Hoover administration. And, and, you know, he's still wearing his big 10 gallon hat or whatever. And Hoover wants everybody wearing their tie, suits and ties, but he actually, you know, kind of breaks a lot of the case and does is, is seen as a really kind of admirable figure in the whole thing. But um, it's just incredibly well-written and really fascinating um, uh, book. And then I also read, um, Oh God, is it six degrees or five degrees? Um, uh, I've been reading a ton of books on climate change lately too. So they're oh. all really enlightening and really scary. It's affecting California so. more than anybody else lately too. Yeah. Well, not anybody else, but in terms of like your wildfires and yeah, yeah. all that. So, um, and then on the film side, you know, again, oh, I just got done watching Barry, uh, which is a, a TV series on HBO. It's half hours, half hour episodes with um, John Hader. And he plays a, or sorry, Bill Hader, and Bill he plays a, a assassin that um, uh, uh, wants to become an actor, and that show is amazing. Like, uh, okay, it, I it watched a few episodes of that. That yeah. is pretty good. That so, slipped, slipped under my radar. I don't have cable yeah. anymore, so like I have to catch all of my um, my TV and movie suggestions on the side of buses. Yeah, I just I just finished. I binge watched that the other day, and it's it's definitely a kind of an acquired taste on some level because it's it's really. It's funny, but it's really dark too, and yeah, it like goes it. to some really dark places. But uh, Henry Winkler's in it, and he's amazing, and Bill Hader's amazing, and and I thought like, um, and there's this guy that plays like this Chechen uh, mobster, and he's, he's super funny. Oh, the bald dude, really, the bald guy, yeah, yeah, super funny, but really fantastic. Um, he's that's his first role too, right? I mean, he's just coming out in that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then I've been, <laughs> I haven't started listening to, I, I just this year since you know the kind of january i'd started listening to podcasts i'd never listened to podcasts really before that so i've just started really kind of listening to podcasts and um i'm listening to armchair expert with Dak shepherd oh okay and, like that guy so i've i've always liked Dak shepherd he's always been you know a, a guy whose kind of career i followed um but he has some amazing guests on and the stuff they talk about even though it's like film and tv is so inspiring to me because you hear about how hard they work and the things that they want for themselves and how just normal they are sometimes. And you're like, Oh, I can't, how can I ever relate to Ashton Kutcher? Right. Like, but then I listen to the podcast with them. And I'm like, Oh, 
That's a guy I want to go like you know have a beer with. Like you, yeah, you know, right. You develop he, these animosities for like yeah. characters, not people. Right. Yeah. And again, I don't I don't know anything about. And I I'd always assumed Dak Shepard because he was on Punk first was a guy that like he he was one of those types. Of, you know, it was more like a Johnny Knoxville type guy. But no, he wanted to be an actor and all that stuff. And then he then he has Johnny Knoxville on the show, and you're like, oh, like I I told like I had no idea that this guy you know got into doing what he was doing because he, you know, he had a kid and he was trying to put food on the table, you know? Right. Um, and so, but they just, I, you know, I learned, a, it's just interesting to be able to kind of take stuff from what those, you know, they talk about on the, their podcast. So I've been listening to a lot of that lately. And it's terrible um, what's happening to uh, Chris Hardwick right now with um, his former relationship kind of in a way. It's kind of hard to talk about even, you don't know what's the balance between that. Right, publicly yeah, yeah. grieving or airing grievances or whatever yeah i mean you would think just a podcaster but she totally destroyed everything that he worked for for like six years just with a, a letter how tangible things are yeah it's tough i mean yeah i don't know how to uh, comment on that yeah man i don't even know why i mentioned yeah. it it's like yeah. oh, okay stop now nope yeah. too late you've already <laughs> left the board <laughs> Um, yeah, man, it's a, it's iffy. This Me Too movement, obviously, we need to pay attention to it because it's very, very yeah. important. And as a man, I mean, you can't, you can't, like I said, you can't even open your mouth. It's like uncomfortable. Your tongue does not want to force the words out. Nope, shut up, dude. Just stop. <laughs> I, yeah, it's interesting because I, I think we have to have the conversations, right? Like, yeah. and I, you know, again, being in the industry that I'm in with in games, um, you know, there are are obviously those same types of of challenges sometimes right and so you know for me a lot of it's just about we have to ask sometimes like is this a environment that you want to work in for everybody right like is it you know um and we try and foster that but it's always tough because you're like how do i you know you want to be able to ask those conversations ask those questions and have those conversations but you also don't want to kind of cross any lines in the process of doing that it's very interesting i mean how do you because when you are doing a video game you are talking about sex you're talking about violence you're talking about fantasy, and when you mix all three of those things together, you could make people very uncomfortable. Yeah, I mean, some of it's about being honest about what you're working on at the upfront. I mean, with Mafia Three, Mafia Three is a very hard M-rated game, and we were very upfront with, you know, everybody that joined the team at the outset that like this is the game that we're making, and that, you know, we're gonna have like, I think it's got more you know f-bombs in it than any game ever, <laughs> um, and we we made sure everybody knew that kind of upfront. But then I tried to foster a culture here of like, look that's the game though. And we have to be able to separate the game from who we are as people and, and how we act in meetings. Right. So like, yeah. and I, you know, I tend to curse like a sailor sometimes, so I have to watch that. But, but the, you know, in terms of just because the characters don't always respect each other in the game and there's a high, de- you know, because the main character is African-American, he runs into a lot of race and it's in the sixties and it's in the South. He runs into a lot of racism, but we never wanted that to bleed over into the, you know, the culture of the team floor. And so we really, you know, kind of, I think we talked about it. We talked about it openly and I think that was really healthy. Um, but there, are, at the same time, I know there were people that were uncomfortable with things in the game and, and they, cause they came and talked to me about it, which is better than the alternative, which is they're uncomfortable and they don't feel yeah. like they can come talk to us about it. Um, I mean, if you're not watching so, people's lives get flushed down the toilet and be no recovery at all, it's kind of interesting that these dialogues are being presented because it does give us an opportunity to create stories around. Yeah them and get more comfortable with different ideas and different cultures and yeah kind of move past this feeling of being like teetering on the verge of destruction i guess yeah well and i think and it it helps too i mean i talk i talk to my wife about a lot of this stuff and that really helps and kind of to ground it because she's very you know um uh, she's, you know, me, you, I mean, if I say stupid things, my wife will immediately tell me. That's why I knew I needed to shut yeah. down the M2 com- uh, Me Too conversation. It's like, nope, yeah. this is not going to go in a great place. Let's stop. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, and that's and, and she's always just like, watch what you, you know, watch what you say, right? Like, and I think, yeah. you know, and I, I'll ask her. I'll be like, hey, I want to have this conversation with somebody on the team about this thing. What do you think? And she kind of helps me wrap my head around it. And then, you know, I have two my my kids. I have two daughters, so I'm also oh, like, wow. oh, I want them to. Be able to have positive, you know, representations of you know female yeah, characters. Girl too, and, man. She's only three right now, but yeah. still, at the same time, I look at her and wonder what her life is going to be like. Is going to be yeah. one of these things where she's constantly fearful and keeping right. things secret, or living a life of open happiness and just not worrying about anything because we've changed the culture through this conversation that we're having right now. And that's what I hope, right? I mean, that's yeah. what I, you know. And again, I'm I'm sure 
and I, and I think a lot of it's soul searching too. Like I'm sure if I, you know, when I, well, I know if I look back at my career and my, you know, things I've done, I've said, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah. My life. Right. I mean, you look at some of stories, you're like, dude, I'm, I'm yeah. not that good. Actually. Right. I guess I'm not as innocent yeah. as I thought I was They self examine, I guess. Yeah. And you just don't even realize the things yeah. that you do that make people uncomfortable until you go back and you look at it and you're like, well, well I, you know, you know, you're young and you're stupid and you're in your, you know, teens or twenties. You're like, oh, I'm flirting with somebody. It's like, yeah, but you know, <laughs> there's that fine line. Right. Like, um, you or, you know, stories I mean, I all the time. I grew up, we always joke that, you know, Orange County called it the orange curtain when I was growing up, you know, you kind of grow up behind the orange curtain and it's, it was a very, you know, especially at that time, Orange County was very conservative. Right. So like, I didn't, you know, I, I didn't meet, you know, really anybody that was openly gay until I got to college and they're like, Oh wait, this is totally like, you know, I think it was the time was that we just grew a cool up, guy. though. Like, I know, you know. Now well, it's yeah, not think... like that. Now at all, not at all. I mean, I knew one gay dude growing up, and he was an older man hanging out right. with freshmen in high school. Yeah, so I'm not really sure what that situation was, but yeah. I didn't know anybody else. I mean, there was one kid in high school that we thought was gay, and turned out to be gay, but it didn't matter at the end of the day. You know what I mean? Right. Um, but yeah, yeah I man, think it was I, the time period too. You know, the movies that you're watching and the the types of slurs and things like that that were used. Remember the Kevin? Now Kevin uh, Costner. What was his name? Kevin fish called wanda oh uh kevin klein yeah he was in a movie yeah. where the teacher was outed by the uh oh yeah oscar winner or something yeah. and that was like yeah. a huge story at that time right. like 90s right. late 90s yeah yeah man i'm really happy yeah. that you know we are able to have these conversations now and that people don't have to be afraid to tell their stories and things that have happened to them fear of persecution or whatever right and um, i'm excited for your career too i'm going to keep my eye out for things that you're doing obviously <clears throat> i'm excited right. for the uh for image the image comic book coming out um is there a release date set for that no not yet we're trying to get enough issues in the can um before we release so that we can you know have a really um kind of satisfying cadence with the first mm -hmm. at least the first arc so uh you know we're hard to work on it right now um jim's been turning out i think some of his best work ever and you know again he did amazing stuff on on sandman and on promethea and on batwoman um, and so to see him even pushing the boundaries further is pretty, pretty fantastic. So, um, but a lot goes into it and we're, uh, I think one of the things we've talked about is we're doing it. Um, the page layout's different. It's, it's meant to be read kind of on its side. So you get these big landscape pages. Oh, interesting. Uh, so yeah. So imagine that it's, it's bound, you know, kind of, um, you know, the staples are at the, the bottom or the top rather than on the side, and then you kind of fold it open. So you get these huge kind of horizon shots and stuff. So it's, that's been interesting because writing it um, has been a different, you know, I have to think a little bit different about, oh, it's the landscape and, you know, we're going to fit, everything's just going to fit a little bit different and flow a little bit different. I've always um, found the idea of writing a picture fascinating. Yeah. I've contacted artists to see if we could do something independently, but it's very difficult to set up. I have a friend or a buddy that I met through this podcast who does a series independently and the amount of work that goes into it is astounding yeah it's pretty cool yeah it yeah it's it's uh i mean i'm really glad that i started doing it early in my career just because it was you know i didn't know what i was doing and so i kind of got to discover how to write for artists and it's very different than obviously writing a novel or anything else i was completely closed-minded when it came to comic books i didn't realize yeah. how good they were until i was an already an old man yeah. and very dodgy and <laughs> yeah um so uh, Again, I've said like five times, thank you so much. Um, my no last question is basically, where can we find you in the World Wide Web? Where do you want people to go to, to interact with you and and ask you to be on their podcasts and stuff? Uh, it's probably the best way is to follow me on Twitter and, and reach out via Twitter. So it's at Hayden Blackman. Um, and uh, I do have, you know, I have a website, uh, HaydenBlackman.com, uh, which is H-A-D-E-N. Uh, and blackman.com um but i you know i update that pretty rarely i'm on i'm most most active on twitter um when i'm active at all it's a combination of raving about horror stuff and uh you know promoting some of my stuff and then ranting about politics so. <laughs> yeah <laughs> man that's pretty much what that. twitter's used for isn't yeah, it nowadays right. yeah i love um, it yeah, and then the other thing I would say that uh, if people want to find, you know, again, my work, uh, the you know, obviously we'll keep updating what's going on with Echo Lands over the next couple months. Cool. Um, you know, Hangar13.com is is the website for the studio that I run, the, the game studio I run, which is part of uh, 2K Games. And then um, 
the uh, most recent thing I did was an anthology book um, called Where We Live. Uh, and that was actually curated by, by J.H. Williams. Um, and it's a benefit book for um, the uh, victims and survivors of uh, the Las Vegas shooting. So, oh, um, yeah, so Jim lives in, in Las Vegas. Um, and so he obviously was profoundly affected by that. Uh, I grew up, again, I think I said earlier, in Seal Beach. And there was a mass shooting in Seal Beach a couple um, years ago that, you know, profoundly affected me um, and, uh, you know, obviously my community there. So uh, it was a very personal project, I think, for, for everybody involved. But there are literally hundreds of creators contributed to this book. So if you like comic books at all, I guarantee there's four or five people whose names you know um, that have contributed to this book. Neil Gaiman, Brian Michael Bendis, a ton of big names contributed to this book. So it's a really worthwhile cause. And again, uh, Image published it. So big, you know, kind of shout out to them for publishing this Image, book. Image, in my opinion, is doing yeah. some of the best work in comic books right now. They're, they're awesome. They've been so great to work with. Like, I, I had a ton of fun working with both DC and Marvel, obviously, because of their properties. Um, and I, you know, was fortunate. I had really great editors at, at both DC and Marvel and, and Dark Horse. I mean, my Randy Stradley at Dark Horse, who kind of, you know, worked with me for a huge chunk of my career uh, there, was just was fantastic. Um, but uh, being able to do original you know, this is an original concept. It's create our own book. Being able to do that with Image has been uh, phenomenal as well. So, and they, again, totally stepped up to the plate with Where We Live. It's a beautiful book. And, um, you know, Jim did a really great job getting a ton of, you know, I think calling it every favor he could to get, you know, a huge roster of creators to, to participate. And it's heavy. I mean, like reading the book, you know, like I'll read four or five stories at a time and then you know, have to like put it Muscle down, failure, bit, but kind of put it down. yeah, uh, <laughs> but, but it's, it's, it, it's beautiful. And I think, uh, again, a really worthwhile, um, you know, purchase. And, and for me, oddly enough, maybe one of the most, you know, the things I'm most proud of working on, um, because, or having worked on because of the, the cause. So, uh, and, uh, I have a very personal poem in there and then a little short story. So, uh, so people should check that out. I talked to a Dave, Daniel Abramson or Abrams, and he said that the best, the highlight of his career is getting a story into a magazine, uh, Isaac Asimov story. Yeah, right. Pages yeah. were touching, yeah. and I imagine that would be pretty thrilling to see your name mixed up in a whole bunch of great people that you've admired their work of. Oh my from. God, yeah, that's it's that that part of it has been really thrilling, and to have you know, because we all feel like we're you know, doing something together, but just again having it be. You know, I think especially as you get older, you're constantly looking at like, am I leaving a, a legacy, a, yeah. a legacy or am I, am I making the world a better place?